Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Dark Parade. I am Bo, I am your host, and uh, very shortly I will be joined by Dan Chase for a look at the last of the movies in a month that is all about stuff that I just wanted to watch and talk about. Uh, I hope this will be a January tradition to start the new year right by just yammering about movies that mean something to me on one level or another. So, uh, to that end, we are going to be discussing Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon, which I think is a terrific movie, and, uh, and you know, you be the judge. Uh, the conversation that Dan and I have, I think, is, is uh, quite entertaining, and we definitely uh, gush over the movie uh, for a number of reasons that you'll hear in a minute. So I'll shut up about, about that part of it. So this month, as I said, has been all about movies that I wanted to watch. Next month will be a listener request month. And I elicited some uh, suggestions from you fine people over on the uh, the Facebook group, uh, facebook.com forward slash groups uh, forward slash dark parade. And there uh, you guys gave me a list of movies that uh, are some good and some seem punitive, but we'll get into all that. I think next month is going to be a lot of fun, so uh, be sure you tune in uh, starting in February for a bunch of movies that you guys have uh, recommended that I should see. So, uh, without further ado, uh, thanks as always for being here. Thanks for enjoying the show. And uh, here's my conversation with Dan, all about Behind the Mask. Once again, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest for tonight. Uh, it was originally going to be two people, but uh, quite frankly, there was just too much personality on this show, <laughs> and and we couldn't have a third. So uh, instead of Dan and Lacey from Cut to the Chase, and, and and good lord, I like keeping up with Lacey is uh, you know a, a fool's errand. Um, but, uh, she unfortunately is a little under the weather, can't join us tonight. Um, but with me instead, or it, it still, I should say, is, uh, is Dan Chase, who was always going to be here. Um, but now we can, uh, say all the terrible things about Lacey we couldn't when she was going to be with us. Exactly. So you ready to start? All right. So here we go. So here's the dirt. No, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's what, that's what people come to this show for. The dirt. The dirt. <laughs> That's the first the, thing I think of when I hear Bo's name. Gotta get the dirt. The hot goss. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> he knows what all the kids are saying these days. I'll ask Bo. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> finger on the pulse. That's what they say about me. Um, <laughs> no, but thank you so much for having me, sir. Um, yeah, it's been a little bit since, uh, you know, our last recording. But, man, those last couple recordings we did were a lot of fun. For sure, we did we did Psycho Three, yep, and, yep, and then I joined you guys for a couple of shows. You did, and yep. uh, yeah, we've had a really good time. We we uh, yeah. we we get rowdy when we get together. I like it. <laughs> it. Never, we never not get rowdy. I will say that. Yeah, for sure. Well, no, because it had been a, a long gap, you know, before those couple recordings. So that's why, um, you know, and Lacey was very under the weather. I'm just feeling better, so I just had to um, make my triumphant, you know, little pause with podcasting. I had to make it. Uh, back on your show, sir. So <laughs> yeah, look, not not the last time, certainly not the first time. Uh, like I said, we have a good time when we when we, uh, when we get together and chat. And uh, I obviously miss Lacey, but we'll we'll do this again and and uh, get her involved for something you know good and trashy. Uh, I feel like we're gonna do it justice though, because this is one of her favorite movies too. So we we have a lot of uh, to live up to. But I have a feeling that you're you have a couple things to say about this movie. <laughs> well, for <laughs> sure, because all right. So here's how it's working out. The January is sort of uh, I, I have declared now that here on the Dark Parade, January is a month dedicated to movies that I just want to talk about. There, yes. it's it's not a series of movies like I enjoy doing movie series and you know we did Psycho and Night of the Demons and the two Let the Right One In <laughs> movies and stuff like that um, yep. and and love doing that stuff 
and there will be more of that to come. Right. But this month for starting a new year, it was like, you know what? Let's start the new year right with just some movies that I dig. And I kind of don't care if other people don't dig them, but I do. And this is one of those movies that as soon as I decided that this was what I was going to do, and also just a brief tangent, a footnote, if you will. So February is all listener request month. And they mm-hmm. fucked me, Dan. They fucked me good. <laughs> oh, no. Assholes. Yeah. Yeah, just this very day, I watched a, a Canadian opus entitled uh, Science Crazed that was made for about a buck and a half. And, and this was <laughs> like it, it, this was penance for this month where I'm just doing all the movies I like. I got a whole stretch of movies where people are like, hey, how about a Chuck Norris movie? Bo loves Chuck Norris. <laughs> so... Missing in action part three. Uh, oh, I, if only. Uh, no, we, we've got Silent Rage coming up. Uh, oh, man. And which, anyway, we'll talk about that in yeah. February. Yeah, it's. That's kind of ruthless, though. You guys need to go easy on Bo. But but I get it, though. I see what you're doing here. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so one of them was good. There, there's a, a one good movie in the mix. Um, and everything else is like, I, you guys are jerks. Um, right. <laughs> well, I know one thing though about you because you are like me, where once we get a topic that we we love and we gush about, that's one thing. I know for me, for podcasting for a while, it just happened to fall in a way where I was reviewing a bunch of bad movies, and you're just fucking negative. Like unless you're taking the piss out of it in a sense where it's funny. Yeah. Um, if you can't find the comedy in it, it just gets kind of depressing talking about movies that you don't really care about not to say that that's that's your situation but for me i was like i don't care what i name it what i package the shows i know that's important but it's also important for me to to cover these movies so i i see exactly where you're coming from and i feel like in podcasting it's very important because you often do go on hey i'm doing this franchise show and that takes a month to record you know Right, and by the time you get to part seven, it's just garbage. Yeah, right. And <laughs> right. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you, I ran into this recently with, because uh, I, I do a, a bonus series called Found Footage Fool, because I am, in fact, a, a fool who likes found footage movies, and those are of questionable quality. But right. I've been on a run of just really bad ones. And so I reached the point... And I was actually recording this bit earlier today where I was like, you know what? We're going to do a good one. I've got, I'll find a good found footage movie to talk about. Even if it's not great, it's just going to be better than this stuff because Mm -hmm. I need to sort of rekindle my love uh, after seeing, I I saw this movie. Listen, I know we're going to get to behind the mask. (laughs) Everybody, everybody calm down. Um, But (laughs) everybody sell down. Um, it was this movie called The Dark Web Tapes. Okay. Hour and 22, 23 minutes, something like that. Yep. A solid 40 minutes of it. Just makeup tips. <laughs> and I'm not <laughs> kidding. On. I'm not kidding. Because, really? yes, because one of the characters is like, a, <sighs> like runs a YouTube channel or whatever oh, doing makeup, like unboxing and, and makeup tests and stuff like that. Uh-huh. And that's all it was for like for forty minutes. I was like, "You've got to be kidding me!" Like it, this is supposed to be a horror movie, and now just between us, Dan, I know yeah. how to make my eyes pop with the right kind of shimmer eyeshadow. <laughs> it, now, it blew now, my mind. Beauty tips for and the for the backstory of Rustin Parr here. This is literally, um, yeah. See, because you on that Blair Witch show, like you go hard, but I think that just shows you that despite the found footage aspect, I mean that. Th- these movies and a lot of the found footage movies after Blair Witch are no Blair Witch. <laughs> right. I mean, you've got to have, as it turns out, you've got to have a story and characters <laughs> and things that oh. happen in the movie. What? Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's it's a stunner. <laughs> and, and I felt bad because the movie before that was a movie called Black Wake, which isn't very good either. Mm-hmm. But at least stuff happened in it. And it really took the dark web tapes to remind me 
that oh i thought black wake was bad <laughs> what if what if you just did a movie and nothing at all ever happened <laughs> except for makeup tips and, and like that is my cinematic hell <laughs> right and right. but you know so as, as on the back end of that like i'll watch exists or something like that that's like okay this is kind of you know a fun uh found footage movie where there are characters and stuff that happens and oh, right <laughs> get exactly. back on the horse but but yep. but that kind of i guess uh leads to this, this uh, that was not a planned transition but it works well because yeah. this is not found footage but it, it's in that mockumentary style right and yeah. there have been certainly a handful of great horror mockumentaries mm -hmm. you know whether it's this or like lake mungo i think is really terrific oh, um yeah. certainly more comedic but like what we do in the shadows is a brilliant movie uh that you know and the show is just as funny if not funnier and yes i agree <laughs> um human bartender jackie daytona one of the greatest <laughs> things to have ever happened on film yes <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Yep. So, right, like it's, it's not that it's easy. Or, or Savage Land is another good example, oh. I think, um, yep. of of that kind of mockumentary style where you're taking traditional horror tropes and then sort of giving it the verite vibe with, uh, you know, like. In this case, you actually have the documentarians as as part of the film, and right. and this isn't fully mockumentary slash found footage because at a certain point in the movie, it just becomes a movie. Right, but that's what I love about it, though. That and it's not necessarily speaking on found footage movies. It's more of you know slashers, serial killers, that type of thing. And the the things that he talks about are character. They're speaking of themselves and obviously other horror characters that we know in a real life sense. Now, that in itself uh, opens what you uh, opens your mind to what exactly you're watching in the first place, I think. Yeah, and one of the things I like so much about Behind the Mask, and this was a, also a great excuse to get that Shout Factory release that's got just yeah. a shit ton of special features and all that that kind of stuff. So, I, again, highly recommend all those Shout Factory releases. I, I can't think of one that I didn't like. Yeah, right. And yeah. Uh, it, it's a, a really nice presentation of the movie and you know has some of the comics that are you know the sequel we'll talk about that on the back end but um yeah, yeah i i mean it is very much a a deconstruction of of slasher movies writ large you know i mean it, it name checks some of the the famous ones in a really you know kind of cheeky way but uh -huh. the the writer said like this was just this kind of random idea of going to bed one night and thinking like, uh, you know, it would suck if Michael Myers had to get up and go to work. <laughs> and right. and that sort of humanizing of a, a slasher uh, icon was where this movie came from. Of like, okay, what, what are the mechanics of being a serial, not just a serial killer, but a, a slasher killer. Like a, right. a, a, right. a, a horror icon. Yes, yes. And, and, and that brings us to... Leslie Vernon and there's uh, so there's Leslie Vernon is is obviously the main character mm -hmm. um, you've got Taylor Gentry who is the documentarian uh, as played by Angela Gerthels I think is how you pronounce the name mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I don't know if you're right but that sounds good to me eh, I'm I'm in the ballpark I hope or Gothels something like that and uh, then there are Doug and Todd her her like cameraman right yep and the whole idea is they're going to follow leslie vernon as he selects his final girl and you know sets up the whole event and and stalks and then kills them all and they're going to document the birth of this you know legendary killer um right. And um, he, 
he says initially he is a local kid who um his, like he killed his family <laughs> and then he got chased out of town and like fell into a mill or some shit and <laughs> yeah. um <laughs> And, but then came back and now is like, you know, I, I'm back to kill again. And you just can't even begin to talk about this movie without talking about Nathan Basil. Oh, man. Like, first of all, as as an actor, too, talk about a champion for this movie and to try and get the sequel made and stuff like that, getting his name out there. I mean, not not to mention he's so charismatic and, and a terrific, terrific actor, which will obviously pinpoint some moments in this film here. But, man, is he just the perfect guy for this role. And I think necessary. I think you need somebody that caliber to carry you through this this journey. Yeah, he's he's done some behind the scenes work as well uh, as doing, you know, some work in acting. But he really is like he's the backbone of this movie. If if he doesn't work, the movie doesn't work, right? And you know, it, it he's done a lot of like post production work mm -hmm. on like Deadliest Catch and a lot of reality reality TV and stuff like that. That's kind of seems to be where he's made his money really okay yeah um yeah. and and done acting gigs here and there but this i mean to the best of my knowledge other than a, a run on a tv show called invasion which i don't recall um behind the mask is kind of his big thing right right which is odd yeah it, it seems strange that because he like you said he's super charismatic Right. And he's very good in this. And and one of the things that he has to be able to do is be very light and be very funny and very personable and also have those very quick turns where he's suddenly very menacing. Right. And right. like he, there, there are a number of times where Taylor is talking to him and he'll kind of get rubbed the wrong way. <laughs> yeah. And, yep. and you start to see the like oh shit like he he could kill her you know and, like and, right absolutely and, and i also think that it just shows especially movies like this too where there aren't you know you cut away to this person then back to this it's all in one shot it's all in one take and that's where i think the and i i don't I can't think of a better term, the found footage, the documentary mm -hmm. style. I think that that's what makes it work. You get to see those emotions. And like you said, you get to see that switch take place, you know, in real time. And for me, and we talked about this on the Blair Witch Show as well, where when stuff happens in real time and you get to see somebody kind of go through the range of emotions that they do, I feel like that is is 10 times more effective than a lot of the shit that we get where, you know, it's it's all lit perfectly and you get your 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 two shots or whatever they call it, you know? So, yeah. I don't know. I, I find it more effective and, again, speaks to his acting ability because, like you said, once that turn happens, like, you watch it. And I don't know. I just find that really interesting to watch um you know watch it play out like in front of you like that and the, you're right and there's also moments and the, the one that i'm thinking of in particular is when he you know he's like he they find out you know he's got his ahab he's got his his <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute but oh, yeah. <laughs> his, yeah. he's got his final girl lined up and there's a moment right before the big night when you know the the legend of of leslie vernon is going to be cemented where he's sitting in his van and he just kind of quietly looks down and he and very emotionally says i'm just so happy right now yes yes <laughs> exactly and it's, you know, it's so strange because you're so like you're on his side until you have those moments where you're like oh wait right he's a murderer i keep forgetting I, that 
Right. And that's the brilliance of this movie, though. And and that's one thing that I think you said, you know, as you explained, you know, what this movie is. It's the, it's the deconstruction of, you know, a slasher, of a serial killer, of how all these things usually play out in all these movies and stuff like that. And it's an interesting perspective. But at the same time, it's, it's almost like... It, it, it's a new look at it, and I, I think that in a lot of ways, it's groundbreaking for what it is, right? Because this hasn't really been done, not at this capacity, but there's a level of respect that they have. You can tell that these filmmakers are clearly horror fans through and through, serial killer fa fanatics and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But in a lot of ways, it's like, you get to that there's that whole thing with oh making the villain sympathetic right that's always been a theme but it seems like as time goes on it's more and more of a prevalent thing so to to take a look at that and put the spotlight on that in itself i find the most interesting part like you said it's like yeah you like this guy but he's making like excuses and he's holding all these things in such a high regard and you know you realize who his mentor is and we'll get into that and that brings legitimacy to it as well and they're speaking in it in such a such a high form and and they're not fucking around here that it really does remind me in a lot of ways of horror fans you know of of people wanting um wanting respect and and not realizing that yeah you know but it may come off as a little crazy or whatever, but um, when you really break it down, it's, uh, it, I don't know, I find it extremely interesting. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, it, it, and much like Scream, Scream kind of does some of the same stuff in terms of breaking down the rules of the slasher movie and so forth, but I think I prefer Behind the Mask to Scream, really. How dare you? I, I know, I know, but I do, <laughs> and and the reason is is because it is strictly from the killer's point of view, hundred percent, and it's, you know, as you said, it's it's like presenting him as the hero, which those characters tend to be. Like you don't go to a Friday the Thirteenth movie for the campers; you're going for Jason, Jason, right? And exactly. and so, and this movie understands that, and is like, okay, well, let's get into like the psychology of it and then you know have some fun with the idea of how do you orchestrate this right and how do you how do you select this and, you know and and leslie himself will say things like well if you want to be one of the big ones like mike or freddie or any of those guys like it takes more work than just what you hear about and and to that end we sort of meet him as he has selected his final girl who is uh, a high school student named Kelly. Yes. And we get a really nice scene of you know her taking out the trash and him, you know, being like lurking in the shadows and things like that and the the door getting locked. And what you realize is that he has set all of this up like, this is not just, hey, I'm going to stand here, and then, well, fingers crossed, she'll yes. get locked out. It's like, no, 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 you've got to you gotta set this up, and you got to make sure you're, you know, basically corralling her where you want her to be. Yes. And it's like that Back to the Future thing, right? It's Back to the Future 2, you're seeing the same scene, but just from a different perspective. And to open up a scene, uh, to open up a movie like that with a scene like that, with no context, obviously planning on explaining it later, is just another reason why this movie kicks so much ass. Like, it literally has everything. It's It doesn't just have, like, hey, we got a good idea, and that's what it's gonna be. Like, no, from the opening scene, they're fucking throwing haymakers, and I love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah, and so some of the stuff, uh, you know, it, it's hard to kind of go in order with this movie because it's just a lot right. of him explaining the process and so forth. But there's stuff about um, like you've got to you've got to work out because you've got to <laughs> look like that you're just walking, but in in actuality you're covering a lot of ground. Love it, love that. <laughs> and you know, he talks about how people like in these extreme circumstances people do weird shit like they all 
kind of collect together, but nobody prote- nobody gets a weapon. Nobody's really protecting themselves. When people start running away from you, they fall. I don't know why. They just kind of do. And <laughs> and they'll also hide themselves in places that are completely obvious. Right. And so it makes my job a little bit easier, but you also have to understand human behavior. Like part of this job isn't just the physical part of it. It's the mental and psychological part of understanding how people behave when they're afraid. Exactly. And he has that code of code of ethics too, where he was like, if they hide in the closet, he was like, we have respect for ourselves. Like we would never, <laughs> you know, Yeah. <laughs> he would never go after in the closet because again, that would mess with the whole, yeah, the whole aura of what they're trying to create in, in real life. It's brilliant. This movie is brilliant. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he also, speaking of the code of ethics and so forth, yeah. there is also this very clear recognition of like, oh, this is all phallic. Like, I am stabbing someone with my knife. They hide in a closet, yeah. which is womb-like. And, oh, right. you know, like, all of that stuff is, you know, it's part of what makes this special. Yep. And so you don't violate those rules and like you kill the final girl last and you know the the slut goes and the stoners go and all that kind of stuff. Yep. You know, which Kevin in the Woods would riff on later but <laughs> right. it, it, it's the same kind of stuff. 100%. And you know and he's like okay so in addition to having this relationship with this girl even though she doesn't know this relationship exists it's <laughs> yeah. it's very uh it's very deep it's very archetypal it is like there is a connection between them that is important for him as a killer right right exactly and, yeah. and this a lot of this comes from you know you mentioned him earlier but there's uh uh Eugene his mentor <laughs> Who is, is uh, absolutely uh, terrific? He, he's played by uh, is his name Scott Wilson? Scott Wilson. Yeah, Scott Wilson. from Herschel uh, himself, man. Yeah, 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 from Walking Dead, and and he is kind of a retired iconic killer mm-hmm. who has settled down with one of his final girls. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, which is great because uh, you know they kind of joke about it and. Uh, when <laughs> when they first go to meet him, he has buried himself. Oh, dude, what an intro to his character. <laughs> for, like, a couple of days. And you can tell, like, uh, Leslie is a fan. He yes. thinks this guy is awesome. And, yes. uh, you know, and there's kind of, like, they're cooking out and they're kind of having a joke about, like, oh, this is a human, is it? You know, like, it's... Um, oh, I love it. That tongue in cheek, just like nonchalant kind of attitude about everything. Because in all reality, too, you know, it's like this isn't a straight up comedy. Like this isn't a horror comedy, like straight up by any means, you know. At several different points, even when it was just, you know, Leslie Vernon himself, I felt like at any point this could just turn right Mm -hmm. so when him and his wife got introduced while it was extremely interesting i was there's a part of me that was always kind of like nervous like they could just flip the script and just murder him at any second which is part of the fun of this movie i feel like especially on first watch yeah oh for sure like the first time you see this it's just there there are enough twists and turns yeah that you know the movie keeps doling out um like after he meets eugene there's a moment um there's a moment in that scene too that i really like where uh taylor is asking like why do you guys do this yeah and it's eugene uh, uh ironically uh, named Eugene, another Walking Dead ah. character. Ah, yes. But uh, Scott Wilson says, "Well, we're the the kind of the yang to the yin of good in the world. Like there can't there can't exist good without evil, and so we are basically fulfilling that role." 
Like we're playing a part. Yeah. That we, that yes, we are part of God's plan. Like not everyone can be a hero. Some people have to be villains, and that's us. Right. And right. and without us, there isn't the opportunity for people to kind of grow and become truly good and truly powerful and truly self actualized. And you know, I, I've thought about it, but I've never actualized that thought as much as you described it. But that's that's really good. I, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that's how they see themselves, and so it's sort of a holy mission in a lot of ways that they are, they're not just, you know, being the, the, the counterbalance, but they're necessary. Right, and, right. And there's also a moment in this conversation where Taylor is like, well, you ought to, you know, kill the local librarian, uh, you know, to start the, the string of deaths. And mm -hmm. Eugene is like, you know, that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> and she's like, no, I was just kidding. Like, you don't really want to do that. And and Leslie is like, oh, yeah, we do. So <laughs> only if she's three feet tall and named Zelda Rubenstein. Right. And again, I look, I'm a sucker for this shit. I love oh, dude. I love a horror movie that, you know, kind of kneels at the altar of the greats and having yes. Zelda Rubenstein come in and, and sort of play that Tangina Barrett kind of role where, <laughs> you know, like Kelly is doing research in the library late one night and she's like, Oh, heaven girl, let me tell you all about Leslie Vernon. And, you know, goes through the legend and everything and sort of suggests that, uh, maybe she might be related to Leslie Vernon. Yep. And, yep. you know, again, very stereotypical kind of slasher movie uh, kind of mechanics. Mm -hmm. and, and and this is the point where Leslie appears in the library. He kills Zelda Rubenstein. But before uh, he can get any further, in pops yet another horror icon, Robert oh, England. Man. That's crazy, yeah. As a psychiatrist, Doc Holleran, mm -hmm. who is like, you know, Leslie, you're never going to get this girl. And so Leslie escapes, and this is the point where he's like, oh my god, I've got an Ahab, I've got an Ahab. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> and, and it's Freddy Krueger. Yeah, and he later explains, well, right. an Ahab is when you have that doctor psychiatrist police officer whoever it is who is your nemesis whose goal it is to stop you from killing yep and yep. now he has one he's got everything he needs for like a legendary night of killing because he's got the guy trying to stop him he's got his final girl he's got the mythology set up kelly is starting to ruminate on the fact that maybe leslie vernon didn't die and um right and, and that leads to a scene where Taylor and her crew are eating in a diner with yes. Doc Holler in there. Yep. And he comes over and he's like, do you think, who do you think he is? You don't really think he is some possessed child returned from the grave, right? And they're like, well, maybe. And he's like, no, no, that's bullshit. His name right. is Leslie Mancuso. He's from <laughs> Reno, Nevada, and he's just crazy. <laughs> that's that's oh, all there I is to it. it. Yeah. I love that though. And <laughs> and so after this, Taylor goes to Leslie and is like, "Hey, man, is this true?" And and Leslie gets real pissed off at her and and right. gets kind of scary yeah and oh, yeah. and this is the point where taylor's like i don't know that we can go on like because this is just a crazy person who has decided to kill people this is not you 100%. know some supernatural agent that we're getting a, a you know a peek through the window at this is right. just a dangerously unstable human being right yep yep and that changed things a, a bit, you know, because he was very dramatic and very extra, very uh, theatrical. And obviously it goes with everything that, you know, about setting these things up and you're going through all the logistics of it and stuff. And he's doing it in a nonchalant way. 
But for for somebody else to break it down like that, like you said, Robert Anglin, his character comes in and then changes that, then you definitely feel like shit's gonna pop off like at any minute, you know? Cause you know he's psychotic, yes. But to hear that that wasn't the story, it just it just adds another element to this movie where it's so much fucking fun to watch. Like you can watch this movie over and over again and just pick out new different things that you, you missed the last time. I don't know. I just, I love that. Yeah. I mean, whether it's the fact that the movie is just peppered with references to other movies, whether it's Elm Street or, you know, uh, Halloween or like any uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like yep. it knows its, its points of reference. And, yes. you know, it's not just aping them. It, it's, it's playing with them in a really fun way, but also you know after having watched this a couple of times preparing for this show it, it, there's also so much within nathan basil's performance yes where you're like oh okay like he is truly playing chess in this movie while taylor is playing checkers right and, and, and yeah sorry no i was just gonna say his manipulation of her is one right. of the most fun things to watch a hundred percent a hundred percent like and and by the way, obviously everybody knows that girl from Home Alone, and I don't think I've seen her in anything since then, <laughs> uh, up until this role. But I think she did a great job. You know, when you're going through this whole thing, she's obviously the one prompting them for everything. So obviously they have the most interaction, right? So for it to play out that that you know in the end, how much he was manipulating her, and you know what it ends up you know turning out to be um i thought it was it was done and delivered you know within the movie i thought it was done and delivered perfectly like it makes sense it's a natural progression like it's not this final girl over here. she's not even a fucking virgin like what yeah <laughs> you know i just i just love how they they kind of put it all out there and yes it's not like it's a huge fucking twist or anything that these certain things happen this is all what it was naturally developing towards but at the same time it's delivered in such a way so eloquently so so perfectly i thought throughout the movie that by the end i don't know man i feel like a lot of movies should be taking their cues like this is good writing you know mm -hmm. forget old documentary style or whatever this is just solid writing and it just builds to everything that by the end it just gives you that good movie feeling like ah all those things earlier paid off every single goddamn thing paid off uh you know they had a fire opening scene you got all these great different scenes that you can dissect to me that just makes such a fucking great movie but there's so much of it throughout this movie and that's what i meant like there's there's almost so much that that you could just pick this movie apart for days yeah yeah and so after there's this moment of like hey i don't know if we should be doing this with this dude <laughs> th then basically leslie asks her like hey, look you said you were committed to this or if you are then you are if you're not then we need to part ways right now because this is the yep. point where shit is about to get real and she's like right. no i'm in i you know I, this is i have committed to this course of action i'm going to follow through with this and then you get after that moment you get some fun stuff with him setting up the house for you know the party that these kids are going to attend and him m m probably my favorite thing is him trimming the branches oh dude i was gonna say the same thing yeah i love that so much it's such a nice detail of like well you don't want them climbing out the windows and running off right so like i've i've i'm cutting these so that if they try to get out then they're gonna fall and hurt themselves or they're not gonna be able to reach it at all and that stuff is really fun um don't they break out the windows? No, you would think. Oh, by the way, this guy totally reminds me of Steve Stifler. Like, sure. This yeah, is, yeah. This is Sean William Scott, like, like better version. And I know he did like a, you know, a killer movie later on. And I think Mason Basile did a better job in this, obviously. But yeah, like the broken window thing. He's like, no, you would think that they would, but no. And if they do by the second floor, 
uh, you know, then they got to climb over all the glass. Like, clearly he's thought of everything, <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, uh, there are certain doors that are kind of screwed shut so that you can't get through. Like, basically, here's how you funnel these people where you want them to be. Here's I, how you sabotage the electrical system in the place. Yeah. And, so uh... Much fun. Yeah, and it, it, right, it's just a good time because the movie goes out of its way to explain the crazy behavior of people in slasher movies right you know right. like all the stuff that you yell at people you like you yell at the screen to tell people like go out the window you know that kind of stuff in this movie it's explained well here's why people don't do that either it's that's just not how people behave when they're scared or you have somebody you know rigging the deck right uh or stacking the deck against these kids and so it comes to the night of yes. <laughs> here. Here's when things are about to get real. Right. This is the night. Yeah. All the kids have assembled at this house. And after all the fun stuff of like setting up the house to go and that kind of thing, Taylor is like, Oh, wait a second. We're about to watch all these, these teenagers get murdered. murdered. <laughs> and, <laughs> They, they ask Leslie, they're like, just don't do this. You know? Okay. Don't, like, you don't have to do this. Like, you're, you've are you proven that you're smart, but you don't have to be a killer. And he's like, no, no, no. I, I can't stop now because I'm this close. Because my survivor girl is about to define herself. Like, by facing me tonight, she is going to become the person that she is supposed to be. Yep. And... Um, he he tells them like you can go right now if you want to, but this is going down. <laughs> Which I love, and you kind of you got to agree with him at that point, right? Like, yeah. he you've been building up to this. You're gonna leave now, right? Yeah, like this is this is why you were following me, right? <laughs> exactly. And yep. and so he, you know, he the the night begins. And this is kind of where the movie transitions from being the mockumentary style to being an actual movie. Now, I got a question for you both. Now, yes. when it now besides the initial, like, I wouldn't say shock, but like the realization that that's what this is now. What did you think of the movie and how it kind of played out as kind of a, you know, a, a classic movie, quote unquote? Yeah, I... I, I will say that it is my least favorite part of the movie is when it yep. just becomes the movie that it's sort of not parodying, but kind of dissecting, right. but also it does it so late in the game yep. that I can't complain too much. And there's still that final twist. Yes. So like there's other stuff in the movie that I love a lot more, but the more that I watch this movie, the first time I saw it in particular, I was like, ah, it's kind of a bummer that it stops being, you know, that dissection of the slasher movie and then just becomes a slasher movie. Right. right. But the more I watch it now, the maybe it's just, you know, familiarity and whatnot and not, not having the expectation that it's just going to be continually clever until the, the credits roll. Right. Um, right that I really kind of enjoy the beats of this now. Like when it becomes the movie, I think the kills are fun. Um, I like, I particularly like the point where he tracks down one of the crew members and it's just like, Leslie, it's me. Oh, you know, like you don't have to kill me. Like we're friends. Right. And he gets killed anyway. Oh man, that's that. I think that's one of my favorite parts of the whole entire movie. Yeah, because like, he, he splits them up, and he was just like, you know, you gotta. Nobody survives. Nobody leaves, or I forget what yeah. the line is. So he runs out, and he gets stuck in some. I don't. I don't know if that was set up earlier. I forget. Uh, some like, you know, mucky mud type stuff that he gets stuck in. But the, it sets up that moment where he takes his mask off. Yeah. And that's, oh my God, that scene, man. Because I never, like, I watched it and obviously it's cool imagery and, and obviously, like, on the surface I know what it means. But I really watched that scene and to see him take his mask off and then he literally grabs his own mask 
and takes it off and just gives him that look. That was the moment that I was like, yeah, man, Nathan Basile is a beast. Like, he, he not only, he doesn't carry this movie, but man, like, he elevates it to such a level where I don't think a lot of people could pull that off. He's He straight has that fucking psycho look in his eyes, man. And you don't see it that often. And it's kind of sad too. It's like, I thought I thought, I thought they were friends. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're kind of sympathizing with this camera guy too. Like, I don't know. It just, it, it's like, a, it, it's like this, this internal thing that kind of rips at you. But I also think that that represents again horror fans in general who always want to side with the villain now so quickly that it's just like you know you really start to break down like whose side you're really on um and i don't know that that scene in particular though it's probably one of my favorite scenes of the entire movie plus when he walks after him and you know the smoke and everything and there's that iconic image i believe it's on the cover it's just it's mm -hmm. perfect yeah oh, it's beautiful yeah, it's really good, and and you know, as the kids start getting picked off, and Taylor runs into the house to tell all these kids, like, "Hey, you need to get out of here. You're all being murdered." And there's right. this guy named Leslie Vernon who's who's trying to kill you all, and and to Kelly, she's like, "And you in particular, because you're a virgin, um, you're his survivor girl." And Kelly's like, "I'm not a virgin. <laughs> what, what the fuck are you talking about?" And this is the moment where Taylor realizes, like, oh, shit, I'm the survivor girl. Oh, I love it. And, I love it. Yeah. And, and did you, yeah. Did you see wonderful. that coming? Like, did you, did you expect them to go that way with it? Yeah, because there's a, a, there's a comment earlier in the movie about her potentially being a virgin. Okay. And, oh. And, and, oh. and as soon as that comment happens, I'm like, oh, I think I see where this is headed. But it's still, like I said, even after seeing it a number of times, the moment where she realizes, like, oh, I'm the girl, right. I think well, is still really jeans, good. Though. You see those jeans she was wearing? I believe she's a virgin. Right. She's got some real mom jeans happening <laughs> uh, in this movie. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so Kelly uh, also tries to escape and gets murdered. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, Kelly. And and Taylor is basically like, we just have to interrupt the pattern. Right. Like if if we throw Leslie off, then you know, th then the whole evening's busted for him, and he'll and he'll stop. Because she knows how important it is to him. Right. To hit all those beats. But... Yeah. Yep. And but unfortunately, that doesn't happen. Leslie just keeps murdering every everyone until. <laughs> it's just taylor there like i said some really fun kills in this the whole sequence in the barn is a really good time oh yeah. um and there there was a, a great bit on the the blu-ray about how that barn sequence only exists because there was another set piece written and then when they went to film it they realized oh we, we don't have the money for that but we do have this barn and so <laughs> they just rewrote it uh for the barn sequence um, nice. Not unlike the fact that in Lost After Dark that we found out there was a slaughterhouse uh, on the the property where they were shooting, and wow. and that exists in Lost After Dark because it just happened to be on the property. That's um, amazing, though. <laughs> yeah, that shit just happens all the time. You know, I was I weirdly I'm I'm working on a uh, not working on it, finished a script. Uh, uh, recently that or a rewrite on a script that's about to go out to some actors and stuff and you know knock on wood all that stuff uh, will will go well but as I was talking to the potential director yeah. he was like well there's this whole centerpiece sequence with a windmill and I don't know if we're going to have the money to do that and I was like well I'll tell you what let's just leave it in the script until somebody tells us we can't afford it <laughs> and he was like you're right that's what we're, we're going to do um, and, and weirdly, that's how low budget movies are made is right. this is probably too expensive, but we're going to wait till a producer tells us that. That's fucking odd. What a way to approach it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and also, Hey, you may find something else and then we'll rewrite it to fit whatever property you find. You know that yeah, that but, stuff yeah, happens but that's all the time. The difference, though, like you know, you're gonna run into problems like that, so might as well reach for the sky and and start here. And yeah, if it doesn't work, whatever. But at least you're starting somewhere, and you got something to go by. Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, we're gonna have the windmill on fire in this in this movie, 
until somebody <laughs> tells us, oh, there. by the way, there's going to be no windmill. Um, I want to fucking read that script, though. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, if you want, I'll send it to you. It's a, a, a Western comedy. So. Oh, my dude, I send it now. Okay, I'll, I'll send it over to you. <laughs> yes. Um, so, anyway, the, right. uh, yeah, so uh, uh, Taylor is now by herself. She's mono imano with Leslie and now understands that that was his plan all along. Yeah. Um, and she, then she ends up like they tussle and whatnot. She ends up getting his head in an apple press. Oh yes. Which is introduced earlier in the movie. Yep. Uh huh. Which he, yes, he points out. Yep. And like, yep. again, it seems very clear that Leslie wanted her to kill him in this manner. Right, right, and that she was going to survive, and the way she was going to survive was by using this apple press and, and crushing his head. Then uh, sets fire to the shed as well, burns it down. He's dead. Uh, Doug and uh, the cameraman and Doc Halloran, uh, who showed up at the farm and was was stabbed, um, they both have survived, and they're like, "We're we're alive. Let's get the hell out of here." Leslie Vernon is dead. <laughs> yeah. And then we get the credit sequence, yes. which I love for three reasons. Oh. Reason number one, I love the talking heads. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the fact that they licensed the song Psycho Killer, fantastic. Yes. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Two, yes. I like the fact that this is just security cam footage of this uh this morgue mm. <laughs> yeah and three i like the fact that the camera holds on it while this morgue attendant like eats a sandwich and goes through paperwork for the entire credits yep until the credits end and then you see leslie sit up and then that's the end of the movie uh, i think really? it's so fucking good it's <laughs> Like, that's what I mean. That scene, the opener scene, obviously, with the rock and the door and everything. This movie is fucking perfect. Damn near perfect. Yeah, it it's so much fun. It, it like, I there are moments where, uh, watching the ending, like I said, I'm like, eh, I kind of wish it didn't turn into a slasher movie. But I'm so glad, ultimately, that it does, because I want this ending where you do get, right. you get the rise of Leslie Vernon. Like, he is now a a serial killer icon. He is now, you know, up there with, uh, with Michael Myers and Freddy and Jason and Leatherface and everybody. Yep. Yep. And, I, and I think that's so... It's satisfying because if the movie just was this kind of arm's length dissection of the slasher movie without ever getting its fingers dirty, <laughs> yeah. then I don't know if it would be as satisfying as it turns out. Right, right. I I, I couldn't agree more. I, I really couldn't. Um, I, I also think that this is a movie where... It's definitely one of those movies where not everybody knows about, which is cool. Like mm -hmm. you gotta be, you gotta be a certain degree of horror fan to know this movie. But I, I, I don't even think this is a fucking bold statement. I just think this is the truth. I think that over time, this movie is gonna age beautifully, and it will, it will be so appreciated. You know, 30, 40 years from now, because I think it's so ahead of its time. And when people say that, I, I like I, I tend to think a certain way of how that fits in. But I just mean like ahead of its time, meaning like you do that and you can't really do that again. Like that's a yeah. one time deal. You could like, OK, let's, let's put it this way. Creep did it in a way. Uh, uh, to, yes, to an extent. Way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm with you. It's, a, it's, a, it's not did it i mean i got to explain what it is but they they take a certain thing i'm final final girl mm -hmm. uh, final girls um the final girls i'm sorry that movie while all different movies or whatever interesting approaches and this is by far not only the most interesting not only the most entertaining 
but just so much fucking fun. Like, as a horror fan, like, Bo, as a writer, like, you must have fucking... I, I can only imagine, like, you watching this movie for the first time. Like, somebody smarter than myself. <laughs> well, you know? Yeah, it's, it's one of those, like, God damn it, that's that's good. You got right. me. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like, there, yeah, so there are yeah. a handful of movies that I watch where I'm like, I wish I had written that. Right. And and this is one of those like and I think you're right. I think it, it has kind of a cult status where not everyone's seen it, but everyone I know who has seen it really likes it. Yep, yep. And I kind of feel the same way about like Tucker and Dale versus Evil, uh -huh. where it's like ah, I don't know that everyone has seen that movie, but the people I know who have seen it re are really fond of it, and right. I, like kind of have a, a place in their in their hearts for it. Yes. Um, yeah, so I, I do think, I, I, I do think it, you're right. I think it's going, going, it has aged well. I think it will continue, uh, to age well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I hope that it, look, if there's anyone who hasn't seen the movie, uh, that is listening to this, uh, sorry yeah. for spoiling it, but also... Go back and watch this movie. It's not that spoiled. Trust me, you're going to get a lot of shit out of this movie that we haven't touched on. Right. And, you know, there's a reason why Scream is my favorite movie. It came to me at a time where I was just learning about horror. It wasn't necessarily my introduction to horror. Like, I had checked out the Freddies, the Jasons, like, you know, several of those on the fringe. But the, the culmination for me, the real, you know, um, octane boost, if you will, was Scream. It all kind of culminated there for me as a young kid. For later on... It was revitalized by Hostel. They really just got me. Um, it, it, there was something about that movie that took me to a place where I just felt fucking horror was really dangerous. And, and it felt very visceral and real to me. Mm -hmm. But I also got it with this movie as well. And that's why I can't, like, I don't even entertain the fucking idea ever ever that horror is dead like there's been several points several movies that i've seen where i'm like holy fucking shit it's just it's one movie you get how many fucking shit movies to your one leslie vernon though and that's the problem yeah yeah but it's not dead though it's never fucking dead you just you gotta find these great ones within the piles of fucking schlock you know yeah and right and and it also comes in waves like taste change yeah. and, and the culture changes and the movies reflect the culture and Agreed. you know so yep you know like i don't know that this movie exists if scream had never happened because i think there there's some dna there but right. i don't know that like the the two aren't common carbon copies of one another no. or anything like that and like i said i kind of prefer this one just because it's a little more fun uh than scream is right. for me but i mean I, I love scream don't get me wrong but um right but and behind the mask is just a, a, like it's a little sillier and i like oh. that i just like how it's a different perspective on, mm -hmm. on the genre you know and i don't care what perspective you take i just appreciate it you know even look at shows like american horror story now whether you like it or not you got to appreciate the fact that they're trying to to come up with 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 new ideas whether it be you know in different formats or whatever however however it comes out because it may take a bunch of whiffs and and a lot of strikeouts but you're gonna get some good stuff out of you know unfortunately what i consider to be an oversaturation um in horror but i don't consider that a bad thing i just think well i mean hey if everybody's happy making their movies great i just don't think that a lot of them make an impact make a difference until because i thought this movie i'm like what is this like i thought it was it just looked stupid. Like, I stayed away from it for a little while. Then I heard people talk about it. I was like, all right, fine, I'll watch it. And then you just feel stupid. You're like, oh, I, ne I never said that. Like, this movie's brilliant. And it just, it took me a while, and I consider myself a, you know, a, a decent, you know, 
quote unquote fan. I I like to check out as much as possible, find all the good stuff. But I stayed away from this for a long time, and damn, do I feel stupid. Shame on me, because this movie's <laughs> brilliant, you know. And it, I, I didn't want to make the comparison to Scream in that sense, but I just feel like for me, there are moments where movies just take a different approach, and. I just appreciate that so much. And then on top of it, they make a good movie to go around it. Good writing, good storytelling, all that great stuff. And I just, I don't know. I'm, I, I, was, I, I was honestly very excited when you asked us to come on this show because I just wanted an excuse to rewatch this movie. And, uh, and I did twice. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. It, yeah, it's, it, it's, yeah. All right, well, let's get into it. So that that's the basic story beats. Uh, as always, uh, phase two of our discussion um, is going to be about the cast. We have already dipped our toes into these waters, but uh, <laughs> you know, again, Nathan Basil as uh, as as Leslie Vernon is yep. so much fun. He's creepy. He's he's you know charismatic. He he's energetic. Um, <laughs> like all of that stuff yep. really works. Um, Angela Gerthel's, I, I think, is the right straight man for this movie. Right, right. And and then all the other, like, Kane Hodder shows up, Zelda Rubenstein is in this, <laughs> Robert England is there, Scott Wilson's really, really fun in this. Oh, great. You know, and, and the thing I always like about Robert England is he just, he takes it seriously, Yep. And so he kind of brings it in this movie. Like, I think he was on set for a week or something. And you can tell that he's there to have a good time. Yes. And it seemed like he did. You know, it wasn't just like, hey, I'm going to show up for a day. I'm going to say these three things and then I'm out of the movie. Um, but he seemed like he was really into it. And, and when you watch some of the behind the scenes stuff, like the whole cast is like, it was fucking Freddy Krueger showed up and we got to hang out with him for a few days and it was awesome because he was like a really nice guy and also would tell stories about Wes Craven and say like this is how you ought to die in a movie and things like that and was like kind of a mentor to all these younger actors which was really cool um, so yeah I think the cast is is very good and especially for a movie like this that's kind of under the radar kind of low budget um getting pe not n avoiding overpaying for a named actor so that you can get someone who isn't as big a name but is really good right. is always the right decision right and i think they all had a respect for the writing and obviously i mean i'm sure when robert england showed up obviously you know he didn't think they were amateurs but it's it's almost like it's it's meta in that way where you know there's a respect like this is the king here you know why wouldn't they listen to him? Like mm -hmm. this isn't a this isn't a joke, and I think that people often like think, oh, it's it's all fun and games. Like th these people, these are their lives. Like Robert Englund is Freddy Krueger, and when you hear him talk about that character and the horror genre and the respect that he does have for Craven and just the knowledge that dude has, you know, and and look at all these. You know, Wes Craven was a was a college professor, I believe, you know, and mm -hmm. these people really just intelligent people that have something to give. So, and I think that obviously getting him was great for them, but it just speaks to how brilliant this this project was. Where, like you said, it's low budget. But you get these these great performances, and I mean Robert Englund's completely over the top in this, but he looked like he was having a fucking blast, and it never came off like this is a parody or anything. It's just they love what they do, and it shows, you know. And and I also get inspired by movies like this because if I was a director or a writer, this would be my dream first project. Mm-hmm. You For know, sure. yeah, yeah. third, fourth, whatever project, you know, but I think it all kind of begins and ends. Uh, well, I wouldn't go as far to say that, but a lot of it is in the casting. And I think the lead and then all obviously all the great icons as well added on uh, was was definitely a good boost as well. So the cast is phenomenal. Yep. Um, and then we come to. Uh, the themes of the movie, again, this is something we have we have certainly touched on 
Um, you know, there in movies like this, there was always kind of the broad theme of good versus evil and whatnot. Um, yeah. But also, this is very much a deconstruction of the slasher movie of trying to understand the behavior of uh, the the characters in slasher movies, whether it's the killer or the victims. And and I would also say that there is there is something being said about journalism as entertainment. Yes. Yes. You Absolutely. Know, yeah, because, I mean, Taylor is... She's constantly kind of going back and forth between if if we capture this guy murdering a bunch of kids, that is going to be an amazing documentary. Mm -hmm. But also it means we're going to stand by and let him kill a bunch of kids. Right. And, and ultimately she can't. Like, to her credit, she can't go through with it. But it's definitely of that stripe of journalism that is more about being sensational than being ethical you know what's funny about that and not that i'm sensational in on any aspect uh, i have a friend that it's a, that's a reporter uh i was just on the news the other night for for just a a, a silly story or whatever but i was still <laughs> no but you're famous like, now i no 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 so we did it or whatever and i was talking to her about that and there is a lot of that you know there is a lot of that like we gotta get the story we gotta you know make it pop it's everything that you thought it's like the tv version of a of a tv crew it's like everything that you thought it was that's exactly what it is yeah. <laughs> like literally beat for beat um and she's a terrific reporter and and journalist but she was giving me some insights, and what you just spoke of is extremely accurate. Extremely. Yep. Yeah, it, it's eh, it's a problem. Um, yes. <laughs> all right, so let's get to, uh, to, to final thoughts here on this movie. And I don't know that I have anything much to add uh, other than what I've said, which is, like, uh, I think my biggest complaint with the movie is when it becomes a slasher movie instead of a movie about slasher movies. Right. But also, I don't know that I would change that. It's just still... It, it is the speed bump that... It, or it's the pothole right. in the movie where I'm like, oh, right, okay, we're doing something different now. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but it's still... I mean, for me, it is the gold standard of making a movie about a certain genre of movies. Right. And Because it is both one of those but it is also like it's it's not so highfalutin that it it never becomes just a scientific study of slasher movies because it ulti ultimately becomes a slasher movie right. um but i i don't know that i can think of a lot of other films that have been as successful in doing this right right you know, I mean, other than something like Scream, but like I said, I kind of prefer this to Scream just for, you know, purely personal reasons. It's not not because I'm knocking Scream. It's a, oh, a it wonderful movie. Oh, it just became personal, all right, Bo. Yeah, this time it's personal. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I, I just think that this is kind of wildly entertaining. It, it, yes. It's, it is a fan of the, the horror genre, but it... the. the the other thing I like is that it doesn't just parade a bunch of horror references in front of you. They're oh. all there. Oh, you know, easy. like there's, yeah, <laughs> there's like references to Hellraiser and references to Black Christmas and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. But yep. it's never a sense of like, hey, kids, look at this. It's just like, <laughs> oh, they're there if you're looking for them. But if you're not, that's fine. You can still enjoy this movie just fine. But if you do pick up on that that like the the uh confetti of horror movie references that that are, uh, is kind of scattered around this movie it just becomes such an inside joke for people who love horror movies right as opposed to like in the new scream when they're talking about you know intelligent horror like the babadook or something that really is to serve no purpose except to show that these kids are horror fans. <laughs> no, nothing else. With this, it actually has a purpose. Like, there's a reason for why they're telling you these things. Yeah, I think of, like, those... 
um, scary movie to some extent, but especially those, uh, they, they haven't made one of these in a while, but like the Hunger Games parodies and shit like oh, that, no. where it was just like, oh. The Star Games? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stuff like that where it's just like, oh, by the way, here's Lil Wayne. And you're like, well, what's the joke? Well, there isn't right. a joke, but it's Lil Wayne. Like, look at him. Yeah, right, he's here. Isn't that look. funny? And you're like, yeah, yeah. no. <laughs> That's, I don't, all right. And and so it doesn't right. ever cross the line into that territory where it's just, uh, you know, trying to be clever by being aware of horror movies. Uh-huh. It's, it's, it's clever enough to be like, no, 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 that's just going to be in the background. And if you want to see it, it's there. And if you don't want to see it, that's fine, too, because we're telling a story with actual characters in front of you. And then if you want to look past them into what's happening in the background, that's fine, too. And more than anything, it's how he's talking about all these characters and these things with such reverence, with such respect. Yeah. It gives the insight into his mind. Yeah, well, and, and ultimately it shows that the filmmakers also yeah. had reverence for that. <laughs> right. You know, right. that they, they were just, like, they were fans. And it, it it's clear that if they weren't fans, they certainly knew how to pretend to be. <laughs> right. And, yeah, they uh, faked it. Yeah. But the, the impression I got is that, the, the like, this movie was written and directed by people who really love horror films and really wanted to do something that was both a love letter to horror movies and also poking a little fun at it too. Right. And, and I, that, it, that's exactly my vibe. I, yep. I love a movie that can kind of capture that spirit of like, I love a thing enough that I can make fun of it and it, and still love it at the same time. Yes. I agree, man. And bring something new to the table. Give give a fresh perspective, a new look. You know, sure. You don't you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Just uh, all right. So just take two steps to the left over here and take that approach. Mm -hmm. And then once somebody does it, everybody goes, "Oh shit, that's brilliant! Why didn't I think of that?" You know, um, with this movie, and I think you said it perfectly, man. But with this movie, for me. It just brings back an element of fun that I mm. love in any movie, you know? And especially with horror movies, I don't know, like, I am very particular with my movies, and I watch a lot of movies, and um, there's a lot that I don't dig. There's just, it, what, for whatever reason, I'm just, I don't feel it. I'm like, all right, like, and especially a lot of people, you know, a lot of movies that people really dig, I'm just like, yeah, that is that is not for me. And I think that one thing that runs, uh, you know, concurrent in all the movies that I truly love is it some element of fun. You know, I'm we, we talked Blair Witch. I mean that that is not a fucking fun ending. That is that is a deeply emotionally traumatizing fucking movie, especially for me. Um, but I don't always want that in my movies. You know, my my favorite ones, like you said, it, it's they can, in a way, lightheartedly touch on the things that you identified with as being a horror fan in the first place, and then to take uh, kind of the the deconstruction path and to go th kind of walk through it because that's what he's doing. He's walking them through it and see kind of behind the scenes. It reminded me of like what a haunted house would be like, see how one of those work or something, you know? And just behind the scenes version of something, I find that so interesting. And then to add all the different layers onto it with the, with, with again, his charisma and everything, it was just a well-made film. Everything was balanced perfectly. Um, I do agree, though, with, with, with what you said, Bo, in terms of the, the end part, because there were some scenes where they were playing the music and stuff like that where it it came off a little parody -y, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it just uh, slightly, slightly to where I'm like, all right, like, I get it. This is what it's all building up towards, and, and, and this is where all those payoffs that we set up in the first half of the film pay off. And they did, 
But again, that would be a weak spot if I were to identify one. But I, uh, it's it's like a needle in a haystack in that barn. Like I'm not gonna pick out, you know, all the bad things in this movie because there's too many fucking good things. There's too many great things, and I think that this movie will stand the test of time. This is a movie where, like, I have a friend, right? Smart kid. He's like. He calls, like, he's like, I'm so excited for the new Scream movie. He's like, <clears throat> in that last movie, when fucking Scream stabbed him in the face, I was like, wait, wait, what? He's like, <laughs> when fucking Scream, when Scream took the knife. And I was like, dude, I was like, <laughs> they call him Ghostface. I was like, you're the only motherfucker that would call him Scream. But, like, he's an intelligent kid. He's down for learning, and he's picking up on all the things in the Scream movies as he's watching them and telling me. And so I know he's smart. So this would be a movie that I would more than happily direct somebody that is just getting into horror that I know is smart, but I want them to just to just get rid of all the fucking shuffle, all the bullshit, and just go right to the fucking heavy hitters. This would be a movie. Like, he would never know about this movie if I didn't direct it towards him, mm. so I would be happy. Like, it's like passing a torch. It's like a it's like a, a rite of passage type thing. So, I don't know, like, as a horror fan, if you're proud of a movie, like, I feel like everybody is proud of this movie. Uh, this is, like, the little movie that, that could, in a lot of ways, because it's low budget, and it's just it's just a gem. Um, yeah, I love this movie. <laughs> Th those are my final thoughts. I just, I love this movie. Yeah, so, in the spirit of fun movies, let me give you a, a, a side recommendation here. Okay. Which, if you haven't seen it, um, it is not, uh, like, this is Damien with faint praise. It's not going <laughs> to change your life, but you're going to have a great time watching it. Okay. It's a movie called Infestation. Okay. And it is about a dude who wakes up cocooned up by bugs that have invaded the world. Wow. And it is, it's kind of cheap. It's very funny. Ray <laughs> Wise shows up as the no, dad and he's I mean, terrific in it. It's, yes, it's very good. And um, <laughs> uh, it's one of those movies that nobody has seen. No. And every time it comes on or every time I run across it, I watch it again because I think it is it's not perfect but it's a hoot and that's it, like it is no rise of leslie Vernon. it doesn't have nearly right. the the cleverness going on but it's got that same spirit of like we're all here to have a good time right like right. let's just have a good time i'm all about it man i'm all about it. i'm so infestation yes you should watch infestation um all right so um, let's rate this thing. As always, this is a scale one to five, and it is also, uh, we allow half stars on account of, uh, you know, being decent people, but we do not allow quarter stars because we're not monsters. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, on a scale of one to five, how would you rate... Uh, Les uh, the uh, behind the mask, the rise of Leslie Vernon. Well, there ain't no fucking half stars involved here. I'm not half half asking any of this. This is a perfect movie. This is five uh, out of five for me. I think that yeah, it has a couple flaws or whatever. I will happily, gladly look over those flaws or those minor gripes that I have with it in lieu of um, experiencing, witnessing one of the more groundbreaking horror movies that I've ever seen and never it's very rare for me to to feel the same way about a movie when I saw it the first time and when I've seen it like the hundredth time like this movie um it was a five the first time I saw it and it was a five throughout and it's a five now I love this movie all right well this is gonna sound crazy because this is both the movie I picked and also the fact that this is a uh, series of shows that I picked because I like them. But <laughs> but, but this is a four-star movie for me. There are little things about it that I'm like, eh, it's not, that's not quite perfect. Or th this, you know, every now and again, there's a line delivery where I'm like, eh, I wish I had a, another take of that. Um, right. But that said, like, the, it's a solid four, though. It's one of those things of like, oh, yes, you should absolutely see behind the mask if you have never seen it it is 
Uh, it is tremendously entertaining. It is very clever. And that lead performance by Nathan Basil is just... It's just one of the most enjoyable things you're going to see in a movie in some time if, you have, if you've never seen it. Um, but before I let you go, Dan. Yes. We have to cover three things that you may not know Uh-oh. about uh, this here film, uh, Behind the Mask. One, uh, the town uh, in which this movie is set, Glen Echo, mm-hmm. is based on director Scott Glosserman's hometown. Okay. And if you look at the production, uh, Glen Echo Entertainment, the the production logo, mm-hmm. there is a carousel that is actually a representation of the broken down carousel from an abandoned theme park uh, in Scott Glosserman's hometown. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Kind Why of didn't fun. they suit there? <laughs> you know, I it's a good question. <laughs> Because uh, an abandoned theme, probably because it's fucking dangerous. Right. <laughs> you know, right. like the insurance makes a difference. Um, <laughs> so number two on our list yeah. is uh, while Leslie is in the library talking to Taylor, he um, is standing uh, right beside a textbook entitled Combustion which is a nod to how he will eventually meet his fate. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and uh, and finally, one thing you may not know about uh, this film, Behind the Mask, is though even... Uh, the, the It's never stated explicitly in the movie, but the implication based on the dialogue is that Eugene is uh, an older version of Billy from Black Christmas. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is amazing, sir. <laughs> and speaking of amazing, Dan. Yes. Thank you for being here. Oh, man. Dude, thank you for having me. I honestly, like, there's there's many times in my life which I'm very grateful, but this one, like, being able to do this movie with you, because I I, I, I want to get serious for a second, Bo, like, I have the utmost respect for you. Um, you've been in the game for a long time. I, I follow you probably more. <laughs> well, you're one of the people that I follow probably most out of anybody, because um, I'm not a huge podcast uh, listener, but there are uh, a lot of times where I just need to hear your thoughts on certain things. And I must say that you never disappoint. So I have the utmost respect for you, sir. So in so to be invited, you know, like on a show of this caliber, uh, of a movie I love, and I know obviously you love, which you rated a four, what? Uh, <laughs> no. I'm stitchy. Uh, I'm stitchy with my grades. <laughs> no, you're, you're just a smarter reviewer than me. Um, I I thank you so much for having me on, man. Honestly, like this was so much fun, and I hope we can do this ten more times uh, this year. Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, I. it's my pleasure. Uh, you, you are the best. Um, returning champion, Dan Chase, uh, I like to say. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, so, uh, we've got some stuff coming up and I will send you that list and, and, yes. you know, we'll, uh, we'll pick your favorites and, and go after it. But, uh, in the meantime, though, uh, I'll fuck it up. I will say everybody ought to be listening to cut to the chase, <laughs> but do a better job than what I just did and tell everybody where they can find you. <laughs> yeah, you can catch me on Cut to the Chase. Uh, we have our Scream 4 and 5 shows dropping very soon. Uh, the Scream 5 show is extremely lengthy because we've seen it several times now, and we have a lot to say on that. Uh, Lacey Lou, who is uh, a little under the weather right now, she's doing her thing. She just dropped an episode of the Slumber Party Massacre, probably one of their best episodes. They did a New Year's uh, episode where they they covered terror train and 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 gave great fucking hilarious uh new year's stories and it's a lot of fun so check her out on that and we're coming back with a lot of content um we've been a little under the weather but we've been plotting planning on some shows so we got a lot of stuff coming up so look forward to that and again thank you so much bro for having me on man this was so much fun my pleasure my man uh all right i'll be right back to close out the show and there you have it 
a, uh, a, a solid hour plus of Dan and I really uh, slavering over um, Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. Uh, it, again, to reiterate what we said on the show, if you've never seen that movie, do yourself a favor and watch Behind the Mask. And if, uh, if you haven't seen it in a while, do yourself a favor and watch it again. The movie's real good. Uh, so, uh, next month, as I said in the upfront, uh, we will be doing listener requests. There are going to be a number of movies that are not as good as this, but I think that it is going to be a really diverse set of movies, and it's going to be a lot of fun to talk about those movies, if perhaps not to watch them. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, at any rate, thanks very much for continuing to support the show. Be sure that, you know, you're rating and reviewing and sharing where you can and all that stuff. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, the, the show continues to grow month over month. And, uh, and that has been the plan all along. That is my sinister design. And, uh, in the upcoming, uh, weeks and months, I expect to do a lot more, uh, kind of interesting side stuff along with the main shows. So... Uh, you know, fingers crossed that, uh, time and all allows for that, but I'm very excited for what's coming in the new year for the Dark Parade, and I appreciate you being along for the ride. As always, if you have any suggestions, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Dark Parade. You can also, uh, find me on Twitter at Dark Parade Pod. And uh, that's pretty much it. Or you can email me at bo, B-O, at legionpodcasts.com if you have any suggestions, recommendations, comments, questions, or concerns. And so that will do it for this January of 2022. I appreciate, as always, uh, all of you listening and participating. Next month is going to be super fun. And until then, there is nothing left to say, but thank you, as always, for joining the Dark Parade. We'll see you next time.